Well, good evening and welcome to the Bible study tonight, this Wednesday, June the 9th, 2021. So glad that you're joining me. I hope you have your Bibles or your electronic device, whatever you're going to be using to follow along in the scriptures. We're back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and uh, going to be um, starting at verse 13 and going through verse 15. So three verses tonight and uh, the title as you may have seen on the uh, YouTube there is What About the Believers Who Have Died? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 through 15. Now as we continue in chapter 4 we come to a familiar passage tonight, and it is the classic New Testament passage on the rapture of the church. It's read very frequently at funeral services uh, because it gives great hope to a family whose loved one has just passed, as well as to anyone who hears it, even us now. Uh, just as we read it, it brings comfort to us. Now, the passage is verse 13 through 18. It completes um, the end of chapter 4. But tonight, we're only going to be looking at the first three verses. Uh, and we'll, Lord willing, uh, finish that next week with verses 16 through 18. But let's go ahead and start tonight and read verse 13 through 15 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm reading from the New American Standard, as usual. And so if you follow along in your Bible or in the scripture that you're using. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get to, into our study. Father, we do thank you so much for the time that we have to come together and to study your word. I just pray, Lord, that uh, you will use this time as you desire. I pray that you will search all of our hearts afresh and anew. If there's any unclean way in us, Lord, we pray that you will reveal that to us so that we may confess it confess that sin and ask that you will forgive us and be cleansed from all unrighteousness, Lord. So we do that now. And we thank you, God, that, uh, that your, spirit, your spirit reveals that to us and that we are able to confess it and that you are willing to forgive through the blood of Jesus. We are grateful for that. Because we don't want anything to hinder our fellowship or hinder our hearing your spirit speak to us through your word and through our study tonight. And God, I do pray that you'll just help me to die to myself so that uh, you are able to speak through me uh, as you desire and to share what you want us to learn tonight. And so, Father, I pray that you do that and just speak through me and use me. And uh, God, just illumine your word as only you can. And we thank you for it. Bless this time we have together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, again, so glad to be with you again and looking at this uh, familiar passage, uh, but I love the way that Paul expresses his desire to teach and inform these new believers in Thessalonica. A good teacher always wants to give and explain as much as they can to their students so that they know and understand as much as possible. It's very beneficial to the student, and a teacher is always wanting to do that, always wanting to make sure they understand and know what they uh, as much as they can. And so Paul is doing that. And as he begins here in verse 13, he transitions from teaching about loving others and working uh, diligently that we studied last week back in verses 9 through 12 with the word but, B-U-T here. So look at verse 13 again, just the first part. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. Now, note, Paul uses the we. Remember, this is Paul, Silas, and Timothy, uh, the missionaries who have invested a lot of time in, in, uh, with the Thessalonians here. And evidently, because of this passage, from Timothy's report, there was some question about what happens to the believers who have already died 
when Jesus comes again. Uh, it is assumed that one of the believers had died since Paul was there. Uh, remember, there has been some time that has passed. And this had brought grief uh, to the new believers because they thought that those who were dead would miss out on something when Jesus returned. Uh, they didn't fully understand everything about his return. So maybe they, uh, maybe that they would be, the, the ones who had died would be at some disadvantage to those who were still alive at that time. So remember, as we've seen throughout here, they have a great love for one another and and their concern for their brother or sister uh, is what has brought this on. But Paul wanted them to understand that they had no need to grieve. They did not need to grieve. And in my studies, uh, Richardson writes, the topic of Christians dying is so important to the Thessalonians that it requires an explanation from the Apostle Paul. The only way we can know about the afterlife is through the revelation found in the Bible. If we have adequate knowledge of what the Bible teaches about this subject, then it will dispel excessive grief in our souls. We can only resolve our ignorance by reading the Bible. We will rid ourselves of excessive grief by eliminating our ignorance about the future. The Thessalonians were clearly looking for the Lord's return at the rapture, but they did not know the state of their dead loved ones until that point. They thought that those who died would miss the rapture. So Paul and, and the others, of course, their, his desire is for them to understand what will happen with those who are asleep. Paul uses the word asleep figuratively, and we're going to look a little more at that later. But he had not had enough time while he was there with them to explain all that would happen. Now, he had told them of the second coming, as we've seen, and they were looking forward to that and with great hope, but they didn't understand all of it. So, as we continue on and want to finish this verse, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Now, this is a phrase that that jumps out a lot of times, uh, jumps out at me, it may jump out at you, but, but it, it has been addressed a lot. As do the rest who have no hope. So why do the rest grieve when a loved one dies? Because the rest means those who are not saved, those who do not know Jesus, those who have no hope. Okay, They don't have the hope that these believers in Thessalonica have found of knowing that Jesus has saved them from their sins, that they uh, will spend eternity with him, and that he is coming back. That hope is not there. Now, there is sorrow, of course, when a Christian dies, but the grief is not as one with no hope. Paul was wanting to get this across. But when you think about it, what can you say to someone whose family member or friend has died and they did not know Jesus? It's very, it's heart-wrenching to think about. Because we know from what the Bible teaches us that anyone who dies and was not saved, had not trusted in Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, spends eternity separated from God in a real place called hell. What can you say to someone to try to comfort them? There are no words that can truly bring comfort. There is no hope of ever seeing that person alive again. That is the despair that Paul did not want the Thessalonians to have. Or to continue to experience. And that is the despair that God does not want us to have either. So why do we not have to grieve, Paul? Well, if we continue on in verse 14, he explains. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Here's the hope that believers have. Not a hope-so hope, 
but a knowing hope. The world has the hope so hope, okay? I hope I've done enough good things. You may have heard that when you ask people, uh, how do you know you're going to get to heaven? Well, I hope I've done enough good things. You know, the good outweighs the bad. That's a hope so. Uh, I hope I'm right in my thinking that there are many ways to God. I hope I'm right in thinking God won't send anyone to hell. He loves them so much, there's no way he could... That's, that's being taught by some people. That is not found in Scripture anywhere. But that's the way some people live their lives. That's the hope they have, that hope so. I hope I sacrificed enough to my God. Other religions that they think they have to sacrifice all these things, or cut themselves, or or even uh, the horrible things about sacrificing other humans. Um, I hope they gave me what I needed in my tomb for the afterlife. You see things about the, the culture of the Egyptians in the tombs of the, the pharaohs and, and all the stuff that they put in their tombs that was supposedly for their afterlife so that they would have what they needed. Uh, that's crazy, but, but in our minds, but in theirs, that was their belief. And they were hoping that they had what they needed. I hope I'm right in thinking there is no afterlife. There are many around us that don't believe in an afterlife. That once you die, that's it here. That's, that's no hope at all. That's hope in only what is happening in this world. And that's very sad as we see, uh, yes, it's great life in God knowing what we have from him but outside of god what does this wor world offer nothing but sickness sadness sorrow death the believer's hope now totally different that is a hope that is a knowing hope and the if in this for if we believe is not an, does not mean uncertainty here. And really a better way to say the wording or a better wording is, and that may be in your, in your translation, for since we believe, okay? Because we believe. So the believer's hope is a knowing hope because we know Jesus died for our sins. We know Jesus rose again. And we know Jesus will come again. And when he does... God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. That's, there's that knowing hope. That's knowing this is what is happening. And that's what Paul is sharing. Charles Stanley says here about this asleep in Jesus. Paul used the word asleep to describe Christians who had already died because our death is not permanent. In fact, Paul tells us to be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. We find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. And every believer will experience a bodily resurrection when we go to live in heaven with our Savior. We find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 40 through 54. Because our Lord Jesus is alive and has a glorified body, we know that we will also be raised bodily from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. So those who have fallen asleep, those who have died, will not miss out on anything. God will bring them uh, with Jesus when he comes again. And there is no need to grieve for them in this way or in, in the fact that they have even died. They are alive with Christ and will be with him when he returns. So how do you know this, Paul? Well, look at verse 15. This first phrase is what seals it. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. Paul is clearly stating that this is what was told to him by God. He did not come with, up with this on his own. He and Silas and Timothy didn't have a brainstorm session to try to say, okay, how is this going to work? 
No, this comes from God. Therefore, it carries his authority. It is God's authoritative word. The Thessalonians can trust that it is true, as well as we can. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. Note that Paul is believing, just as the Thessalonians believed, that Christ's return was imminent. They fully expected his return in their lifetime. We who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. Now, let me ask this. Do we believe that? Do you believe that Jesus will come again in your lifetime? Now, we all know that it could be, it could happen. Paul and the, uh, the Thessalonians believed that. That's way back in the first century, okay? First century A.D. And it didn't happen then. And a lot of people have gotten lax on that because of that. Well, you know, it's been 2,000 years and I hadn't, I hadn't seen him. But do you believe that Jesus will return in your lifetime? Could it happen today? And if you do believe that, how do our lives show that belief? Now, what are we doing that shows we believe Jesus will come back today, tomorrow, next month? If we truly believe that he will return very soon, I think our witnessing would be much more insistent. There would be an urgency within us to reach out to the lost. That should be seen in our lives if we truly care for the lost. May God search each of our hearts in that matter. Okay? We who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Now the revelation that the living believers will not have any advantage over the dead believers at the return of Christ provides the truth that should make any further feeling of grieving for dead believers wholly unjustified. Paul is teaching that both classes of believers, whether alive or dead, at the Lord's return will share the same destiny at the same time. Now, I know you probably want to go ahead and go into verse 16 um, to complete the chapter. But there is a lot in that text, in those three verses, okay, that I won't spend more time on than tonight's time allows. So, Lord willing, we will look at that uh, and look at Paul's full explanation of the events at the rapture and finish the, the chapter uh, next week. Okay, But the, tonight, the Thessalonians question about their brothers and sisters who have died before Jesus' return has been answered. That they don't need to be grieving over that. And they don't need to be concerned that everything will be okay. So, But even Paul is revealing even more uh, by the word that was given to him by the Lord in this matter. So as we continue to look at that next week, we will see more of what um, Paul is giving them, is teaching them and instructing them uh, than even that they ask for. And so that'll, that'll be good. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the, night, uh, the time that you've given us, Lord, tonight, and just pray that you've been able to use uh, this study, use me as you desired, and that you were able to teach us uh, what we you desired us to learn tonight. We pray that we have learned that. God, we thank you that you give us the understanding. That you give us the hope. You give us the life uh, that we need, Lord. You are so good. And we thank you that, that you are continuing to teach us as Paul was using this letter to teach the Thessalonians. And we pray that you will continue to do that as we continue to study. Thank you again, God, for your great love for us. 
your concern for us and your desire for us to know and to gain the knowledge that we need so that we can live our lives uh, uh, even better and more faithfully in following your ways. And we pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, thank you for joining me tonight. I hope that you will be able to uh, join me next week as, uh, as we look at the final part of this, final three verses of this chapter and, and see what is happening. Uh, but it's good to know that uh, when someone dies, that's in the Lord, that uh, Paul teaches us that when we are absent from the body, we are present with the Lord, and we know that, and that at the time of Jesus' return, we will all be gathered up together. Those who are still alive, those who are dead, uh, have passed on uh, from all back uh, to, the, to the beginning of time. We will all come together at that time with Jesus, and we can rejoice in that. And we'll hear a little more about that, of course, in verses 16 through 18. Until then, you stay safe, and I uh, hope to see you on Sunday, and, uh, and uh, that where we can worship together. And uh, I look forward to that. Look forward to that time. Well, God bless you. Take care.